welcome everyone this morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Last Sabbath we began to look at the history of the three angels' messages. And this Sabbath we want to look at the focus in on the second angel's message in the history. The three angels' messages were once given in 1840 to 44, but they will have a repeat soon in the scriptures of Revelation 18, 1 through 4, in the loud cry. And God wants us to swell the messages to a loud cry. He wants everyone on planet Earth, really, everyone on planet Earth, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, to be a part of the three angels' messages. He wanted everyone on the Noah's Ark. <laughs> he didn't want to. He didn't want to destroy everyone. He wants everyone to come to repentance. Yes. And so we are living at this time for one purpose, and that was to that is to give the three angels' messages. Any other job we have is just tent-making job, like Paul had. Bow your heads with me as I have a word of prayer together. Father in heaven, we seek your, again, your help and your presence at this time. Please help me as I present the message. We ask for your Holy Spirit and your heavenly angels to be here with us. Waft away Satan and his angels. Thank you for each one that is here. Give us each a blessing, a Sabbath day's blessing. And to, to be more firmly planted and standing on that firm platform of the three angels' messages with Jesus standing with us. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so these messages are very important. We're going, we, these were some of the, uh, that was the health nugget last week. This week the health nugget was going to be that if we are obedient to God and keeping his commandments, um, God promises that he won't give any, put any diseases on us that he puts on the Egyptians. Sin has a great effect on our own life, physically, and, uh, as well as spiritually, and also on the environment. It affects the whole world of nature, as we saw when Adam sinned. And so, if we are suffering from a disease, our first course is to examine our lives. Are we obeying all ten commandments? Amen. And God will... Uh, work more speedily to bring us to health. Uh, William Miller began the Three Angels Messages in 1831 and 1833. A great, the greatest meteor shower in the history of the world happened. None have been greater since that time. And the, it was the last sign of Christ's second coming. The attention of the people was, was turning now to William Miller's message. And he began with the first angel's message, the hour of God's judgment of the first angel's message. He tied it with Daniel 8, 14. Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. He said sometime between the spring of 1843, the spring of 1844. We know that when, when 1844 happened, um, well, other ministers started joining with them. When 1844 happened, there was a little disappointment. Mostly, lay, mostly um, uh, laymen were in the work. They were searching their lives, trying to get ready for Christ's second coming. And when they expected him to come, they experienced the bitter disappointment known as the little disappointment. Uh, so the movement was growing still at this time. This was, what time of the, what date was this? The spring, this was the spring of 1844. And we saw the bridegroom did not appear. The churches expected the Advent movement to collapse, but it didn't. And that's because God was leading this movement with the Word of God, and He still is. This is a movement of people. It's not like an, this was not like a, organization where they had everything planned and followed out. The Holy Spirit was leading and Jesus was leading through the Word of God. And they saw that you know, God, God is leading His people today 
just as he did the children of Israel, to the promised land. He's leading, uh, he's leading us to the promised land today. And, and the Word, Jesus is the Word, and this Word is the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire for us, leading us to the promised land. And so the Word said, told them that uh, they experienced a little disappointment. The bridegroom tarried. They, thought, they saw that they were fulfilling this parable, and they called this time the tarrying time. They didn't know, couldn't explain it, but they just saw that the Bible called it the tearing time, and then they saw other Bible verses also speaking of it, of this time of tearing. Hebrews, or Habakkuk 2 verse 3, and Hebrews 10, 35 through 37. Ye have need of patience, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. And so, uh, even though the this was a time when the virgins were sleeping, five were wise and five were foolish. The foolish were slumbering in deep slumber. Slumber. The five were just were trusting God, they, but they could not understand what was in the future, and they were searching their Bibles. They saw God's people saw that the church systems had rejected the first angel's message, mocking God's people. You're still here. Ha ha ha. And they were, they were scorning the people that, who gave the message of the first angel. Ellen White says, Why were, were the doctrine and preaching of Christ's second coming so unwelcome to the churches? They did not wish to be disturbed in their pursuit of pleasure, their devotion to money-making, and their ambition for worldly honor. That sounds very familiar for our day too, doesn't it? Hence the enmity and opposition excited against the Advent faith and those who proclaimed it. The stock market probably wasn't as big in, in that day, I'm not sure, but today church systems are tied together to the economy with their investments <coughs> in the stock markets. And, uh, recently the Norwegian Union protested against the General Conference saying you should not invest in the uh, the arms industry and so um, um, they were aware that there were investments in the arm, arm, armament industry and the general conference did change that in their spring session and so the protestants i mean so god's people saw that there was another message after the first angel's message which was the second angel's message that applied to the Protestants. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. They saw that it was the Protestant churches because it came after the first angel's message and after the 2300 days had been fulfilled. The Catholic church, they saw, had fallen centuries earlier. But they saw that Babylon, the mother, was the mother of harlots. So her daughter harlots, her daughter church systems, the Protestant churches, church systems, were fallen, fallen because of the rejection of the first angel's message. And the uh, Protestant church systems wanted to control church and state as well as the mother. And that is called in the Bible, fornication. And Babylon the Great will make how many nations? All nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. That's a prophecy. And it's not totally fulfilled yet, but it will be. All nations will drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The wine represents her false doctrine and her church-state system. When you join church and state in any way, it lowers your standards and your doctrines, and, um, and you become a worldly church system. So God, wanted, God actually wanted to use the Protestant churches to give the three angels messages, but they chose to reject it, and so they fell in 1844. And in 1844, they started to fall. But the fall will not be complete till the Sunday law. And that's when the 
uh, three angels' messages will become present tense. Babylon will have fully fallen. The, uh, the image of the beast will have been created. And the mark of the beast will be enforced. They tie together the message of the second angel with the verse in Revelation 18, verse 4. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come what? Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Two reasons for coming out. That ye be not partakers of her sins. This is corporate sin. It's not, and it's not sin in the church. It's not one person, one leader doing something bad. It's when the church system itself is violating God's law. And in the 28 statements, you have things that, in, as a system now, the Adventist General Conference-sponsored Adventism is in corporate sin. Point number two, we will look at it more. How many have received the Omega of Apostasy? Um, and in that book, you'll see that the a new Catholic concept of God came into the church in 1980, a false concept of God. This is violating the first commandment. Church members are allowed to go into the armed forces and uh, violate the sixth commandment. In the hospital systems, abortions on demand are practiced, which also violates the sixth commandment. These are corporate sins. God holds us accountable for corporate sins. And that's the principle of the second angel's message. The principle. No matter what organization, God wants us uh, separate from any organization. Labor unions, secret societies also. But the second, the second angel's message applies specifically to church systems. Fallen church systems. God's people during this tearing time started giving the second angel's message revelation 18 4 was connected with matthew 25 or 6 behold the bridegroom cometh go ye out to meet him out of the fallen church systems this message is not new in isaiah 52 verse 11 it says depart ye depart ye go, go ye out from thence touch no unclean thing go ye out of the midst of her be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 6.14 This is our baptismal vow. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. But there's more to this verse. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Right. And that's a promise. A second, a second angel's message promise. It's a requirement. It's our baptismal vow. And so, Ellen White says in early writings, Then I saw these disappointed ones rise after the first little disappointment, they rise and in harmony with the second angel proclaim, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. The light from the angels penetrated the darkness everywhere. Then I heard a voice saying to those who had been pushed and derided, Come out from among them and touch not the unclean. Those who uh, were in the fallen churches, they were given the message, Come out. In obedience to this voice, a large number broke the cords which bound them, leaving the companies that were in darkness, joined those who had previously gained their freedom, and joyfully united their voices with them. It was a movement of people. I heard the voice of earnest, agonizing prayer from a few who still remained in the companies that were in darkness. The ministers and leading men were passing around in these different companies, fastening the cords more firmly. But still I heard this voice of earnest prayer. Then I saw those who had been praying reach out their hands for help toward the united company who were free, rejoicing in God. And the answer from the, those who were free as they earnestly looked to heaven and pointed upward was, 
come out from among them and be separate. I saw individuals struggling for freedom and at last broke the cords that bound them. Indi individuals. Sometimes you have to act as an individual. You can't wait, okay, when, when my friend does it or when my family does it, I will come. But no, as, all by yourself, you have to stand for righteousness. Amen. And the first angel's message with the everlasting gospel cleanses us from sin. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. The second angel's message cleanses us from corporate sin. That's a kind of a sin that the Adventist church has lost a comprehension of. But it's part of the three angels' messages. And at the top, the general conference has no understanding about the second or third angel's message at this time. Now we're going to look at testimonies who broke the cords and gained their freedom. These are testimonies that you will have never, you've never heard of before. They are found in the, remember Joshua Himes published the uh, Signs of the Times in Boston and the Midnight Cry in New York. These are testimonies that were found in that internet of their day. Testimonies, living testimonies. There were some who, who who came out of the churches much earlier than the second angel's message, before it was given. George Storrs was one. George Storrs was the person that gave the light of the state of the dead to the Advent movement, single-handedly. In 1840, Storrs finally resigned from the church, feeling he could not remain faithful to God if he remained in it. In 1844, February 15, he, he wrote this, which was published. Well, say some, if they will turn us out, let them do it. We're going to stay in the church until they kick us out. But George Storrs says, but does God say, or God says, does God say, stay in here until you are turned out? No, he says, come out of her, my people. Come out of this confusion, this Babylon. Joseph Bates came out in 1841. One, And so uh, the second angel's message was the spring of 1844. So these were coming out years earlier. Joseph Bates writes about this time, the church elected a pastor who was a source of deep trial to those who were more deeply interested in the ad Advent what? <coughs> movement. It's a movement. It's not an organization. It's, it's, it is an organization. It's, organi it's organized by truth. The three angel's messages are have three steps and a firm platform at the top. There are blocks and pins, Ellen White says, don't move a block or a pin. It's a structure of truth. But it's not a, uh, we're not, they are not looking for directions from human leaders. It's a movement of, with Jesus leading this movement. He says several of these interested ones sought and obtained their what? Dismission. But he didn't. I continued in deep trial on this point for several weeks, hoping for some change for the better. Maybe the pastor will, re will repent. I besought the Lord for light in this matter, and, he, and that which was granted me was to quietly withdraw and be free. In 1846, he writes this about a Christian church. It's an assembly or congregation of faithful men. The, an anti-Christian church is an assembly or congregation of unfaithful men. This church proves itself corrupt and anti-Christian, first, by trampling on humanity or disregarding its claims. Second, by becoming carnally minded and covetous. Third, by ceasing to do the work which Christian churches were founded. Fourth, by disregarding or renouncing any of the fundamental truths of the Bible. This, I believe, is the mildest form of an anti-Christian church, and whosoever remains, whoever remains in it is far from being blameless in the sight of men, and of course criminal in the sight of God. Hence the imperious necessity for the call, come out of her, my people. In 1843, Silas Hawley wrote this. The great mass of Miller's converts, 200 of them, have not joined any of the existing sects. They stand by themselves. Nearly all are such, near, nearly all such are living, 
thriving Christians and strong in the belief of a speedy advent. The others have the spiritual asthma. It's hard for them to breathe. Those who remain in the, who went into the churches. In November of 1843, you know, Ellen White and her family, her father's family, were kicked out of the Methodist church. Most of my father's family were full believers in the Advent and for bearing testimony to this glorious doctrine. Seven of us were at one time cast out of the Methodist Church. Hannah Dunning in 1843, November, writes, or, uh, or they wrote about her, Whereas Mrs. Hannah Dunning, having embraced the doctrines lately preached in this city concerning the second advent of the Savior, has been immersed or baptized by those preaching these doctrines, thereby gainsaying her first baptism, all contrary to the doctrines and practices of the Associate Reformed Church, resolve that Mrs. Hannah Dunning be and hereby is suspended from church privileges until she repent. Brother Troll, December 20, 1843. We hold our meetings separate from the church as usual and the church, thinking our names not worthy a place on their book, on Tuesday last, rejected five of us from their ranks. But I trust our names are all registered in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. By the way, in the New Testament period, where were the churches meeting? In, in homes. In homes. When was the first church building built? Remember, the early Christian church was persecuted by pagan Rome. It wasn't, the first Christian building wasn't built till 313 AD at least by Constantine. It wasn't until that time when uh, the church, the real Christian church is almost always underground Christianity, a movement of people. Levi Stockman. 1543. Who is Levi Stockman? Anyone remember? This was Ellen White's pastor in Portland, Maine. He says, I was summoned before a council of preachers by the uh, it was a Methodist church, I believe, a Portland district. No, the, to answer the following charge. It was Ellen White's pastor after they left the Methodist church. He was in, he was in charge of the second advent. Um, gathering the second advent uh, company in Portland charge so they charged Levi Stockman with disseminating doctrines contrary to our articles of religion as explained by our standard authors Charles Fitch gave his testimony in March 14 1844 by the way he's he uh, gave a sermon in Cleveland in the spring of 1844 that is marked or is seen as the beginning of the second angel's message in Cleveland, Ohio, he gave it. But he had this testimony a few months earlier, and I think this is this should be our testimony. I now wish to say through your paper to the world that I do from this time regard myself and hereby proclaim myself to all men as free and independent of all ecclesiastical do domination as a member of no sect and a subscriber to no creed. The only creed is the word of God that we have. Ellen White saw that Charles Fitch would be in heaven in the book Early Writings with, with Levi Stockman. John P. Bell, for this hope's sake, several of us have been recently excluded from the North Baptist Church, April 3, 1844. April 10, at this juncture, G. W. Spaulding writes, The Advent Brethren quietly retired to a private house and have since had separate meetings to comfort and exhort one another as the scriptures require. And remember that Jesus said, Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there will I be in your midst, in thy midst. I think he said this to be an encouragement to us at this time of great apostasy. Great apostasy? Yes. Um, if you look, if you study the words in Malachi 2, let's turn to Malachi 2. Malachi chapter 2, there are words describing the tribe of Levi there. 
Malachi chapter 2, and verse 5 says, talking about verse 4, it says, the end of verse 4, I'll read verse 4, Ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear of for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. That's the first angel's message, isn't it? The law of truth was in his mouth, and iniquity was not found in his lips. lips. This is sounding like the 144,000. Mm -hmm. He walked with me in peace, in equity, and did turn many away from iniquity. That's just like Daniel 12, verse 3. And they did turn many to righteousness. They, they were shining as the stars in the midst of heaven. Stars are shining at night, Daniel 12, verse 3. Night, like a great apostasy, during the time of great apostasy. And the tribe of Levi here, they were in a great apostasy too, weren't they? The golden calf apostasy. That's when Aaron called for their gold, and the tribe of Levi said, No, we will not give our gold. We will not support this apostasy golden calf apostasy with our gold and finances or our presence in these worship services. They were separated from that apostasy and God honored them by making them the priestly tribe for the children of Israel because they were faithful in a great apostasy and uh, we are living in such a time in a great apostasy that will grow deeper and deeper as the darkness of midnight Ellen White says, nothing will be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. First Selected Messages 204 and 205. So here, the tribe of Levi, the tribe of Levi in the Old Testament, the tribe of Levi in the Old Testament and the 144,000 are seen as having the same character. The 144,000 will go through a great apostasy like the tribe of Levi. Thomas Smith, April 4, 1844. I am expecting the end of all things is at hand, and under the conviction of this truth, I have withdrawn from the Methodist Episcopal Church and ministry, in whose communion I have lived for more than 23 years and have been an accredited preacher among them 20 years. So in order to, in order to join the movement, he had to come out of the fallen churches. Elder Galusha tended his resignation last Sabbath and is now free to preach the whole truth without being desired to conform his preaching to the taste of a Laodicean church. That sounds very familiar too. February 8, 1844. April 18. I have tended my resignation to the conference of the Methodist Protestant Church. I have been a number I've been a member of that body for nine years past. Josiah Litch writes, True, some have left the churches with which they were connected. And why? The answer is obvious in many instances. It is because they have been gagged and muzzled there and forbidden to talk about their coming Lord. Forbidden to talk about you can overcome sin. Yes, you can overcome sin. Um, and preach the true gospel. Hannah White, I then felt it my duty to ask my dismission from the church. Yes, I can say that I was then willing to sacrifice my good name in the world with nominal friends, reputation and all for Christ's sake. And for some ministers today, it will require such a sacrifice, will, willingness to uh, lose your job in the church, lose your salary, lose maybe your even your sustentation to stand with God's people in the truth. Joseph Bates, right? The Advent Doctrine, he's talking about the second angel's message was the last and crowning test which God ever gave his people to come away and separate themselves from all unrighteous unbelievers. Why, who does not remember what a perfect rush there was to get out of these churches just before the message ended in the closing up of a cry at midnight. So they were saying, Joseph Bates and James White, let me just see if James White is uh, well, Joseph Bates and James White both said that the second angel's message was the last gasp opportunity for God's people to come out of the churches. 
They should have come out years earlier, like George Storrs, Joseph Bates, and others. Josiah Litch came out earlier as well. Um, they should have come out much earlier, but the second angel's message was pulling them out of the churches like, like the angels were putting, pulling Lot out of Sodom. Because what is hovering over the churches? Revelation 18, verse 4. Come out, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye what? Receive not of her plagues. The plagues are hanging over the fallen church systems, just like they were hang, hanging over Sodom in Lot's day. 50,000 people left the ch fallen church systems in William Miller's day. This message will be repeated when the loud cry will be given. Now we're going. Ellen White says, Great Controversy 51. Can we all read this together? Romanists have persisted in bringing against Protestants the charge of heresy and willful separation from the true church. But these accusations apply rather to themselves. They are the ones who laid down the banner of Christ and departed from the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Okay. Willful separation from the true church? No. They were the true church standing on the truth, following Christ, in order, to, in order not to remain a false church departing away from Christ into apostasy. And so uh, this experience was uh, not new to the Second Advent believers in the 1840s. You know, some people, some people, uh, the, the, the White family, Ellen White and her family, could have said, we're going to remain in the, Ellen, in the Methodist church because God's going to clean it up. <laughs> no, when they left, they were the true Methodist church getting cleaned up mm -hmm. from corporate sin. Mm -hmm. And so that's what God, God wants us to be true Seventh-day Adventists, standing on the platform of the three angels' messages. Yes. Cleanse from our individual sins, the first angels' message. Cleanse from corporate sin, the second angels' message. Mm -hmm. And standing clothed in Christ's righteousness by faith mm -hmm. in the third angels' message, calling people to come out of sin. Mm -hmm. And those up here, don't go back into sin. What was that verse we learned last night? Proverbs 10, 28? Verse 12, 12, 28. What did it say? It says, I'll read it. Proverbs 12, 28. It says, um, In the way of righteousness is life, and in the pathway thereof there is no death. There's no death. So that kind of means we cannot join the armed forces today. Organizations that are designed to bring death upon the world. God wants us in his army. And the giving the three angels messages to bring life. The path of righteousness is life. So the first angels message was giving, being given in the spring of 1844. A little disappointment. And that's when the second angel's message was pro proclaimed. There was the tarrying time. Then they came to the summer of 1844, when the midnight cry would be given, the summer of 1844. By the end of the midnight cry, 50,000 would go out. See, in the, the midnight cry included the second angel's message. 50,000 people would come out of the churches and in the fall of 1844 would be a great disappointment. 49,900 would go back into a different position. They would go back to the tarrying time or they would go back to the fallen churches saying that the second angel's message was not of God. But those who did not go back, the 100, 50 in one part of New York, 50 in another in the New England area, they searched the Word of God. They discovered the sanctuary message. By the spring of 1844, they were proclaiming the Sabbath as a movement of people. 
And in the next year, the Second Advent, the Second Advent Review and the Sabbath Herald was being published. And now it's just, what is it? Just the Review. So the, the name of that paper needs to be re revived. We need a, we need a paper to uh, revive the three angels' messages. Here's the true Seventh-day Adventist church standing on the platform of the three angels' messages. Fear God and give glory to Him. It's actually a glorious land too. Cleansed from individual sin. Cleansed from... They're not members of organizations in sin. And they take the third step. Sanctified for being sanctified by God for sealing it. James White writes, The third angel's message was and still is a warning to the saints to hold fast and not go back and receive the marks which the virgin band got rid of during the second angel's cry. Word to the Little Flock, page 11. You can download Word to the Little Flock. It's a very, it's a small booklet, but it is a very uh, important little booklet for God's people then and today. The three angels' messages are like standing on a mountaintop. You get a good view from the top of the three angels' messages. Ellen, said, Ellen White writes in that vision, remember, she had uh, of the God's people walking up the narrow pathway. As we heard the sounds of mirth and revelry that seemed to come from the abyss below, we shuddered. We heard the profane oath, the vulgar jest, the low, vile songs. We heard the war songs and the dance song. So the three angels' messages were standing above the mists of sin. We heard the instrumental music and loud laughter mingled with cursing and cries of anguish and bitter wailing and were more anxious than ever to keep upon the narrow, difficult pathway. Ellen White writes, I then saw the third angel. said, my accompanying angel, fearful is his work, awful is his mission. He is the angel to select the wheat from the tares and seal or bind the wheat for the heavenly garner. These things should engross the whole mind, the whole entire attention. Remember that tares are plants that you, you cannot tell a wheat from a tear unless you can judge the heart, which we can. So we can't, the tares will always be with the wheat, even with those that are coming out of Babylon. But Alan White in Christ Object Lessons, page 71, says that open sin should always be eradicated from the church. And so tares are not in open sin. So there's another class of plant, which are obvious weeds. Obvious weeds should always, in open sin, should always be removed from the church. So don't let the, oh, the wheat and the tares grow together, keep you in, a, in an open apostasy. The angel with the writer's inkhorn is to place a mark upon the foreheads of all who are separated from sin and sinners. And the destroying angel follows this angel. Now notice, what angel has the writer's inkhorn? That was the third angel. He's, he has the seal to bind the wheat for the heavenly garment. So that third angel has the writer's inkhorn, who is to place a mark upon the foreheads of all who are separated from what? Sin and sinners. And the destroying angel, that's the seven last plagues, followed this angel. They're destroyed separated from sin. They've heeded the first angel's message and they've heeded the second angel's message. Separated from sin and sinners. The third angel is the sealing angel. This is the logo of the three angel's messages to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. There followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, that great city. She made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. What does fallen mean? Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come what? A falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. It's a falling away from truth into an apostasy. It's a falling away. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, falling away from truth. And that's because it's a church that has lost the power of the gospel 
to change men from the inside, mm -hmm. and so it has turned to the power of the state mm -hmm. to change men from the outside and force people to. Uh, and so when you turn, turn, you join church and state, there is a falling away automatically. What is the wine of the wrath of a fornication? One of the angels with the seven plagues says, Come hither, I will show you the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. This is the, a woman represents the church, but it becomes a great whore when it unites with the kings of the earth. Did you know Adra gets most of its money from the government? Yeah. Yes. And the hospital systems and the universities, mm -hmm. most most of its funds from the government. Um, this is just causing damage to the to the Advent the, the Seventh Day Adventist Church. It's already caused damage, but nothing will be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. To the, to the to the General Conference, it's a sign that we are a legitimate church system but it's really destroying the church. What is Babylon? It's called the mother of harlots. It's a woman, the mother of harlots, an impure woman joined with the state. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 2, I am jealous over you with godly jealous, jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. We should be married to Christ and depend on Him for our salvation and our sustenance. The chaste virgin is the true church. Revelation 12 is the true church. Revelation 17, the false church. One church believes in Jesus to save what? From sin. And the church in Revelation 17 believes in Jesus to save in sin. Both believe in Jesus. By the way, the Revelation 12 woman believes in Jesus. Revelation 7. Do they believe in the same Jesus? No. What's the difference? Um, the Revelation 12 woman. Well, it's more than that. The Revelation 12 woman believes in the Jesus that came in our fallen humanity. Hebrews chapter 2, Romans 1 verse 3, Romans 8 verse 3. Christ came in our fallen humanity. This Jesus in Revelation 17 is a different Jesus. He came in immaculate flesh. Yes. By the way, the doctrine of the immaculate conception. What, who is that about? Mary. It's about Mary being conceived by her mother immaculately so that Jesus, even in her womb, was not even touched by fallen humanity. And why did why was Mary, why did Mary have to be uh, conceived in immaculate flesh? Another doctrine. The doctrine of original sin. That you, that and if everyone born guilty, everyone is born guilty of Adam's sin. Not just inclined with the, not only just inclined with the heart, inclined to sin. You are guilty of Adam's sin. And so that gave rise to another false doctrine. If you're born guilty, what do you need? You need the church to baptize you. Infant baptism. And if you're baptized as an infant, when you grow up, you're automatically part of the church and part of the state. Union of church and state. And so, and, and during the Dark Ages, no one could comprehend separation of church and state. Thank, thank God that God raised up the United States, the first country in the history of the world to separate church and state and give liberty of conscience so that we can stand all by ourselves on the truth. We don't need a, we do not need a piece of paper from, okay, you need a piece of paper from your pastor showing that you, no, we can stand all by ourselves for believing the truth. That we, that we do not believe in bearing arms, that we can't take that test on the Sabbath day, and let God, uh, let God's will be done. Here's the mother 
By the way, she's writing the seven-headed piece. These are the, did you know that each head, if you take every beast in Revelation 7, every head is represented by a beast in Daniel 7, Daniel 7, and in the book of Revelation. Every head is represented by a beast in Daniel 7 and the book of Revelation. And so if you put them in order, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, Pagan Rome was the fourth head. And then the beast. The beast receives a deadly wound. So in Revelation 17, five are fallen. One is. One is is the what number head? Sixth head. And there's a beast that comes out in Revelation chapter 11. Who is that? That was atheism. Warring against the two witnesses. So atheism, atheism gives the papacy a deadly wound. And we're presently living in the time of atheism, um, the heyday of atheism, even in America. Um, and the head number seven will be the United States, the two-horned beast that looks like a lamb, speaks like a dragon, and tells all the world to worship the first beast whose deadly wound is healed, which becomes the eighth head, which is one of the seven. And so every beast, every head is is a beast in Daniel 7 and the book of Revelation. In Revelation 13, beast actually looks like a lion, a bear, a leopard, and it gets its power from the fourth head, the, the dragon, and the fourth dreadful beast. And so it's, it's like an index of the first four heads right there in uh, the beast of Revelation 13. But Pope Benedict, who was Cardinal Ratzinger, wrote to all the bishops of the Catholic Church declaring that the Catholic Church is the mother of other church systems. He's actually interpreting Revelation 17. Do not refer to Christian churches from Orthodox to Protestants as sister churches of the Catholic Church. It must be always clear that the one holy Catholic and apostolic universal church is not the sister, but the mother of all churches. I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. This shows that these verses in Revelation 17 happen after the 1260 days of papal persecution. She's drunken with the blood of the saints. So Revelation 17 wasn't written as if it was in John's day. John did write it, but he was transported by the Spirit and one of the plague angels told him about Revelation 17. The, the same plague angel, angels told him about the, the city coming down from heaven, the New Jerusalem. Was that in John's day? No. And Revelation 17 is not in John's day either. It's happening in our day, in the time period from 1798 to 1844 up to the present, until the Sunday law when, when the, when the uh, United States, Protestant America, will have fallen fully on the Sunday law and the papacy will have risen up at the Sunday law that is when the seventh and the eighth have come into being that's when Revelation 17 will be a really present truth chapter so it was drunken with the saints and Babylon had him on her forehead mystery Babylon the great the mother of harlots and all the abominations of the earth it's a mother of harlots. And so the Lutheran Church, the Episcopal Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Assemblies of God, the Baptist, Methodist Church, and other church systems are daughters of the Roman Catholic Church system, part of Babylon the Great. And we have to, this is important knowledge for God's people at this time. It's it will be called Babylon the Great. And I believe that every country in the world will have a church-state system of one type or another when uh, things wrap up. There followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, because she made all nations. That's a prophecy right there. And not all nations. There are still some that are atheists that do not, who have barred the cr Christian churches from entering their nations. In 1989, you had a great uh, opening up of 
or fall of communism, where the Eastern communist countries in Eastern Europe, 22 countries fell to communism and opened up to sip Babylonian wine. But there's still five remaining. Can you guess which ones? One is China, North Korea, Vietnam, Laos, and one more. It's not on this map. Russia has fallen to communism, opened up to uh, Babylon, Babylon wine in the form of Russian Orthodox Church system. Russian Orthodox Church system is in control in Russia today. And so, this, so the uh, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses as an organization have been banned now. And when they have been banned, that means all the organizations have been banned. They're just operating under, under the permission of the government and the Russian Orthodox Church. But they, but they have not barked or squeaked or anything. But, but they're going to uh, lose it as well. It is Cuba. Cuba is still communist. But Second Angel's message says all these nations will sip the wine of Babylon, the wine of her fornication. Come out of her, my people. God makes a distinction between the people, this is important, and the system that they're in. Come out of her, my people. God, most of God's people are in the fallen church systems. Ellen White writes in 14.210, the great heart of the work is at Battle Creek, and as, or Washington, and as the human heart throws its living current of blood into all parts of the body, so does the management at this place, the headquarters of our church, affect the whole body of believers. Some people say, well, I'm staying, my little country church is pretty good, we're conservative, and, and um, we're not affected by what the general conference does. But you get the, you get the Insight magazine and different things, and, um, it, and you can't have, if the pulpit is controlled, your whole building is owned by the conference. Ellen White continues, if the physical heart is healthy, the blood that is sent from it through the system is also healthy. But if this fountain is impure, the whole organism becomes diseased by the poison of the vital fluid. So it is with us. 14, page 210. If the heart of the work becomes corrupt, the whole church in its various branches and interests scattered abroad over the face of the earth suffers in consequence. <laughs> Just think of if it was possible, you say, okay, I'm going to stay until it gets cleaned up. Say that all the wicked do leave, you would have, we, you would have to start over anyway. Getting your, the hospital systems would have to be sold because it's, the university system would have to be, you'd have to start over anyway. So, um, and so the, the church is like a tree with its divisions, unions, conferences, pastors, and elders and teachers, and members at the twigs. And God wants us to be separate from the source of the uh, pollution. You could go on the other side with Pope and uh, Cardinals and Archbishops and Bishops and Priests and all the way to the... And on this tree, you have the conservative churches, but you also have the celebration churches. How can they bear two kinds of fruit like that? Come out from among them and be separate. God, God holds us accountable for corporate sin. That ye be not partakers of her sins. And here are some of the sins. A false God. False Christ. By the way, since 1955 and 56, the Adventist Church have accepted a false God and false Christ in the secret Martin and Barnhouse meetings. I, a lot of, as I was growing up in the church, these meetings were always said to be, well, it's just words. You can be a good Adventist and you can believe Christ came in fallen humanity. And you can be a good Adventist and believe that he came in uh, immaculate, sinless flesh. It doesn't matter. But one's a false Christ. These things do matter. And it needs to be repented of. 
The false God was the one in three God, one, one being who manifests himself as three persons. Ellen White talks about the heavenly trio, three distinct eternal beings, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's not, uh, and the no Holy Spirit people, they just believe in a variation of the Trinity doctrine and don't even know it. Sunday keeping is another corporate sin. The churches themselves teach to violate God's law. Investments in the stock market, abortions in the hospitals, thousands of members in good standing killing in the armed forces, chaplains in the armed forces. Yes, chaplains in the armed forces. They're the most ecumenical uh, trained people in the church systems because they have to minister to all sorts of people. They cannot give the three angels messages. They cannot teach to keep the Ten Commandments and their salary is paid by the government. Union of church and state, ecumenism, all these are corporate sins that God wants us to be free from. Ecumenicalism, one baptism, one Lord's Supper, one ministry, the BEM document, probably never heard of that. Adventist Church signed it in 1982. Pur purveyors of Babylonian wine, the ABC bookstores, purveying Babylonian wine with fallen Protestant and Catholic authors. Babylonian holidays. We need to separate from Babylonian holidays. No commands by God in the Word to celebrate these days. This is coming out of Babylon too. These holidays were added by man. Catholic tradition. You could also say pagan. Pagan tradition. Christmas. Christmas. Really the rebirth of the sun. Oh, we'll just name it Christ's birthday. December 25, the uh, darkest day of the year. Ishtar. The goddess of fertility worshipped at this time. Easter eggs and Easter bunnies. This was when Spring was, things were blossoming again, and, the, and sunrise services. Did you know Jesus was resurrected when it was dark, before the sunrise, showing that he had power, he was greater than the uh, power of the sun. So sunrise, Easter sunrise services are an abomination. It's directing people's minds to Babylonian thinking. Babel, another Babylonian holiday, also is hallowed even. October 31, what, what special thing did happen on October 31? Somebody nailed 95 protests on the church door at Wittenberg. Martin Luther nailed it on Halloween day, you know, uh, October 31. And so we can, we can mark that day as the beginning of the Reformation in a good way. But it's the, this, is actually, this is the worst day, the most evil, occult, uh, spiritualistic day that we should have nothing to do with. Nothing to do with. Make sure any games that are spiritualistic, make sure that any movies, any uh, books, novels, clean it out of your house. Be separate from uh, Babylon. May your house be clean as well. Valentine's Day. And even St. Patrick's Day. Just an excuse to drink a lot of alcohol. All these days, God says, come out. Don't participate in them. Come out of Babylonian holidays. Rome began by enjoining what God had not forbidden. So God never forbid us to, to um, celebrate Christ's resurrection and his birth. It's nowhere in the Bible. But she ends up by forbidding what he had ex explicitly enjoined. We're supposed to keep the Sabbath. But, but you end up forbidding what God did say to do. So don't add anything to the word of God. We are to stand on the platform of the three angels' messages. Righteousness by faith. 
At the Sunday law, they become present tense. The judgment of the living happens. Right now, we're in the judgment of the dead. Babylon will have fully fallen. The image of the beast will have formed. The mark of the beast will be real and in force. And the seal of God will be real. So at the Sunday law, the three angels' messages become present tense. Wherefore, Jesus, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate, Hebrews 13, verse 2. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach, Hebrews 13, verse 13. Okay. We're going to stop there then. At, this, at that time. God bless us all to be separate from Babylon. Because what is another name for the two-horned beast that looks like a lamb, speaks like a dragon? United States, United States in a religious way, Protestant America. But what's another name the Bible gives the two-horned beast that looks like a lamb, speaks like a dragon? Revelation 19, verse 10. The false prophet. The false prophet is the same. The false prophet is the Protestant churches. And Jesus said, Beware of false prophets that come to you in sheep's clothing, but are inwardly as ravening wolves, dressed in sheep's clothing. So, so the second angel's message is a protection for God's people to come out and where the truth can be uh, worshiped. We can worship God in spirit and in truth. God bless us all to that end.